Welcome to the PV online course. In this chapter we cover the topic of how a solar cell works. In this teaching unit the photoelectric effect will be explained. We consider a photon which has exactly the energy corresponding to the band gap of a semiconductor. This photon can also be understood as a wave, for example as electromagnetic radiation. This wave now hits the semiconductor shown. There the radiation is absorbed. As a result an electron is lifted from the valence into the conduction band. A hole remains. An electron hole pair is formed. Now when electromagnetic radiation with a photon energy smaller than the band cap hits the semiconductor no absorption of the radiation takes place. The process of lifting an electron to the center of the band gap does not occur because there are no allowed states here. This process is shown here only for didactical reasons. It does not exist in reality. So the photon does not give its energy to the electron. The electromagnetic radiation has no interaction with the semiconductor the light is transmitted. If the energy of the photon is now greater than the band gap, the previously described process of absorption takes place. An electron hole pair is formed. However, the electron now has an energy greater than the lower edge of the valence band. The excess energy is released as heat to the crystal lattice. This continues until the electron is in the most favorable energetic state possible in the conduction band. Which of the three processes described takes place depends crucially on the energy of the photon. This can be calculated with the help of f photon, the frequency of the photon. H is the Planck's quantum of action. The energy of the photon can also be calculated with the help of its wavelength, lambda photon. C is the speed of light. The wavelength of the photon is inversely proportional to the energy of the photon. So the energy of a photon is inversely proportional to its wavelength. The wavelength at which the photon is exactly the energy of the band gap, e.g., is called the cutoff wavelength. Only photons with a smaller wavelength than the cutoff wavelength can lift an electron from the valence to the conduction band. The figure shows the power density of the solar spectrum in watt per square meter and micrometer as a function of wavelengths in nanometer. Lambda g the cutoff wavelengths of crystalline silicon with 1120 nanometer has now been entered into the graph. The part of the solar spectrum that can be used for this material is drawn in orange. This is a portion of the spectrum with a wavelength less than the cutoff wavelengths. In a solar cell made of crystalline silicon, photons with a wavelength larger than the cutoff wavelengths then contribute to the transmission losses. In this diagram, to the right side of the cutoff wavelengths. This was the second process mentioned earlier, with photons having an energy smaller than the band gap. In the contrary, photons with a wavelength smaller than the cutoff wavelengths contribute to the thermalization losses with increasing wavelengths. This process was described as the third one previously. Here the excess energy is released as heat to the crystal lattice. If we now substitute the values and units for Planck's quantum of action, the speed of light and the elementary charge into the formula for the cutoff wavelengths, we get the following expression. The cutoff wavelength is 1.24 micrometer times electron volt divided by the band gap. 
With this formula, you can calculate the cutoff wavelengths quite easily. Finally, we also consider the annihilation, the recombination of free charge carriers. An electron is in the conduction band as shown here. In special proximity, there is a hole in the valence band. It can now happen that the electron gives up its energy again and falls from the conduction band to the free place in the valence band. It is said it recombines with the hole that is there. The energy that the electron loses in the recombination is given off in form of heat or radiation. This process becomes more likely if there is an impurity, for example an iron atom, in the middle of the band gap. This additional energy level in the forbidden zone of silicon makes the process of recombination much more likely. The average time that elapses between the generation and recombination of a minority charge carrier is called the lifetime tau. It is about 100 microseconds in doped silicons nowadays. We have now learned about the following formation phenomena of charge carriers. Electron hole pairs are formed in an intrinsic semiconductor by thermal excitation. By doping an intrinsic semiconductor, foreign atoms, here boron, are introduced into the semiconductor, here silicon. For further the illustration, we only look at the additionally introduced holes, the number of which roughly corresponds to the number of doping atoms. We can already estimate the order of magnitude of the charge carrier concentration. For the majorities, it corresponds to the density of dopant atoms. The density of the thermally generated charge carriers is then obtained using the intrinsic charge carrier density. More electron hole pairs are now generated by incident photons. On the following slides, we will calculate the concentration of these photogenerated charge carriers. To do this, we first make a few assumptions. First, the power density of the incident radiation on the semiconductor is 1000 Watt per square meter. Second, the sunlight has a maximum intensity at a wavelength of 550 nanometer. So, we will only look at this wavelength at first. The thickness of the semiconductor is 185 micrometer, which is a typical value for a solar cell. Another important para parameter is the lifetime of the minority charge carriers. In p doped silicon, where most photons are absorbed in a classical solar cell, electrons, which are the minorities there, live about 100 microseconds. Now, to find out how the concentration of the holes and the electrons in the valence and conduction band changes due to the internal photoelectric effect, we must first calculate what the energy of a photon is. To do this, we again use the formula that links the photon energy to the co corresponding wavelengths of light. Here we insert H, C and the light wavelengths at which the solar spectrum has its radiation maximum, hence 550 nanometer. For the average energy of a photon, we get a value of 3.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19 joule. Next, we calculate how many photons are absorbed by the solar cells. To do this, we divide the power density of the incident sunlight, hence 1000 watt per square meter, by the energy of a photon. Thus, we get the number of photons that hits one square meter of semiconductor per second, namely about 2.8 times 10 to the power of 21 photons per square meter per second. The irradiated photons now create electron hole pairs in the crystalline silicons by the internal photoelectric effect. We assume that only two-thirds of the photons contribute to the generation of charged carriers due tra to transmission losses. 
Thus, 1.85 times 10 to the power of 21 electron hole pairs are created per square meter in second. Now we also consider the limited lifetime of the minorities. This is 100 microseconds. Of the electron hole pairs created in one second, they are never more than 1.85 times 10 to the power of 21 to be found on a square meter at the same time. To arrive at a charge carrier density per volume, we consider the thickness of the solar cell. This is 185 micrometer. The generated charge carrier density is thus calculated as 10 to the power of 15 per cubic centimeter. In p-silicon, the holes are the majorities. Their concentration is typically 10 to the power of 16 per cubic centimeter. The concentration of holes produced by the light incident is 10 to the power of 15 per cubic centimeter as just calculated. The electrons are the minority carriers in p-silicon. Since holes times electron density always gives the intrinsic charge carrier concentration squared, we can also calculate the electron concentration in the p-region. Ni is 1.1 times 10 to the power of 10 per cubic centimeter at 300 K in crystalline silicon. This then gives a minority ca carrier concentration in the p-region of around about 10,000 per cubic centimeter. The concentration of electrons generated by light incident, however, is 10 times to the power of 15 per cubic centimeter as above. We now compare the charge carrier densities of an illuminated semiconductor with an unilluminated one. In the dark, the hole density in the p-region is 10 to the power of 16 per cubic centimeter. Irradiation with sunlight adds 10 to the power of 15 per cubic centimeter. But this can be neglected. The electron density in p-doped a semiconductor in the dark is 10 to the power of 4 per cubic centimeter or 10,000 per cubic centimeter. Irradiation adds 10 to the power of 15 electrons, which is 100 billion times more. The 10,000 electrons present in the doped semiconductor can be neglected. The charge carriers produced by the photoelectric effect have a significant influence on the minority charge carriers. The influence on the majority charge carriers, on the other hand, can be neglected. This can be illustrated by a comparison with princes and princesses. There are one million times more princes than princesses. The princes are the majorities, the princesses are the minorities. This is, of course, a very bad ratio. If now 1,000 princes are added, there are still 1 million times more princes than princesses. So the ratio doesn't not change much. If, on the other hand, 1,000 princesses are added, then the ratio is 1 to 1,000, which, of course, is already much better. Let us summarize. Photons whose energy is higher than the band gap can lift an electron from the valence to the conduction band. The wavelengths associated with the band gap is called the cutoff wavelengths. Electrons can fall back from the conduction into the valence band and recombine with a hole. In an illuminated doped semiconductor, the number of minority carriers is significantly increased while the number of majority carriers remains about the same. We have now dealt with the internal photoelectric effect. This will later explain the photocurrent in a solar cell. In order to also understand the photovoltage in a solar cell, we'll first look at the charge carrier transport and then also the p-injunction in the next chapters. 
Thank you for your attention.